The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on where you are in the world, and thanks for joining us for a webinar on the newly published book, Active Coral Restoration, Techniques for a Changing Planet. This webinar is co-sponsored by the Reef Resilience Network and the Coral Restoration Consortium. My name is Caitlin Lustick, and I will be hosting the webinar today. Joining us are five of the authors. Dr. David Vaughn, is a marine scientist and previous director at Harbor Branch Oceanographic Oceans, Reefs, and Aquariums, the Oceanic Institute, Moat Marine Lab, and Philippe Cousteau Foundation, Earth Echo International, and is now president, CEO, and founder of Plant a Million Corals Foundation. In his spare time, he brought together a list of experts in the field of coral restoration to write this book, and he served as the, the editor. Ken Niedemeyer is a founder of the Coral Restoration Foundation and Reef Resilience International, or sorry, Reef Renewal International. When he is not traveling and setting up reef restoration programs throughout the Caribbean, he works in the Florida Keys developing new and innovative ways to grow and outplant 20 different species of Caribbean corals. Dr. Sarah Fries Torres is an oceanographer and marine ecologist. She leads the Coral Reefs Program at Vulcan Inc. and the Paul G. Allen Family Foundation, focused on coral reef restoration adapted to climate change. Her prior work includes leading coral reef restoration projects in the Indian Ocean and coral reef conservation in Florida and the Caribbean. Jake Keel is a sustainability innovator, author, and award-winning documentary filmmaker. For 16 years, he's confronted social and environmental challenges in the tourism industry as Vice President of Sustainability of Grupo Punta Cana in the Dominican Republic. And Dr. Tali Vardy has been with NOAA Fisheries since 2012 and is a co-founder of the Coral Restoration Consortium. She earned her PhD at Scripps Institution of Oceanography and graduated with a master's in conservation biology from the University of Pennsylvania. Along with the entire Coral Restoration Consortium leadership team, she has published six priorities to advance the science and practice of coral reef restoration worldwide in restoration ecology. Next slide, please. Before we begin, I would like to go over a few housekeeping items. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be one hour and 30 minutes. There will be a question and answer period at the end of the presentations. There are two ways you can ask questions. You can use the question box anytime throughout the webinar to send questions, and we will keep track of these for the end of the presentations. Or you can raise your hand during the question and answer session, and I will call on you to ask your question during that time. You can raise your hand by clicking on the small hand icon on the toolbar next to your name. If you're having any technical difficulties, such as trouble hearing or seeing the slides, please type a message in the question box and we'll try to help you resolve the issue. Next slide. Before I turn this over to our presenters, please tell us a little about yourself by answering the following questions. First, what is the focus region of your work? I'll give you a few sec seconds to respond to the question and then we'll share responses. So it looks like we are mostly the Caribbean Atlantic, um, followed by the Pacific, Southeast Asia, Indian Ocean, and other. And the second question relates to the type of work that you do.
end. We have a majority of students followed by researchers and scientists, restoration practice practitioners, marine resource managers, and other. Thanks for participating in the poll. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to our first speaker who is Dr. Dave Vaughn. Well, thank you very much, Caitlin. And thank you all for watching this webinar. Um, this is about really our big evolution now in coral restoration of moving into what we call active coral rec restoration. And even though I'm the editor, I'd like to thank also my 72 contributors and 23 chapters of, for helping to put this together. Next. And one of the things that I'd like to show off is the cover of this book. And uh, in this cover, um, I chose uh, the Fragments of Hope with Lisa Carnes and in, in what she has done in Belize, as there are too many pictures now in many places of what the corals used to look like to what it looks like just a few years ago. And here and in many of the other case study chapters, you will find pictures and documentations of how we can turn that arrow around. That picture at the top was the first Elkhorn coral you can see there near Laughing Bird K. And uh, just six years later, that's the same Elkhorn coral you see in the foreground on the left and the other staghorns that were planted and all the fish that are in that same spot. Please see some of the other chapters besides the Belize chapter in, in this book when you can to see how things have gone uh, the before and after pictures, the correct direction. Next. And for most of you who know Dr. Ruth Gates, uh, this book, she passed away during the writing of it and was going to do one of the chapters. So I've dedicated this book, as many of the other authors know, in memory of Ruth Gates, who many of you know her enthusiasm and dedication, especially to the evolution, assisted evolution of of corals. And uh, I'd like to dedicate it to her, as well as to all of those who contributed to these chapters. Next. The foreword, I'm very blessed and pleased that Philippe Cousteau wrote. And uh, part of it really simplifies in that this beautiful garden, underwater Garden of Eden that we were used to, that there is hope for the future. And also to all those people who's on the shoulders of giants, we made this giant step and it's our sincere gratitude. Next. Who's this book for? Well, it's for really active coral restoration. It's a timely one that is more of the active restoration technology that's described in one of the chapters of what is active versus passive. And it's the 600 pages of those 72 authors contributed with over 250 color photographs included, which makes it a little bit expensive because of all those photographs. But also at the end of this webinar, we'll give you the chance here and also at Reef Futures meeting to get a 30% discount from the publisher that you'll see in the chat box. So who is it really for? Well, it's actually for all of those categories you just saw put up in the poll for practitioners, research scientists, research managers, aquarists, volunteers, students, and policymakers. So if you are any of those people who see in these, this colored portion or in any of those categories in the poll, this book is for you. Next slide. Well, what's not in this book? What's not in this book is a very important omission. And that is, it's not a substitute for combating climate change, but it is a stopgap to be able to be a two-prong approach to be able to restore and contain the ecosystem uh, processes while we are trying to combat climate change. Hopefully there are thousands of people that are working to stop the overuse of our resources by burning fossil fuels out of control. And it's also will be the kind of technology needed so that once we come to our senses and stop the stressors, 
to be able to build back something that still exists, not just for the species of corals, but for the hundreds of species of fish and the thousands of species of invertebrates that call and require a functioning coral reef as their home. So there's a lot of things in this book. It goes for an introduction of information. It also talks about the biological portions. It also is new and emerging methods. It also goes over with those biological things, everything from hatcheries, sexual reproduction, land-based, field-based nurseries, and all of the concepts and procedures that you would need. And near the end, we have 11 case studies from around the world, 11 countries, a case studies written by multiple authors who show what the good and the bad and the, even the ugly of hurricane damage can do to a system and what works for other communities and other location. And finally, near the end, it also has downloadable record sheets for data collection, uh, growth, uh, environmental uh, parameters, so you don't have to build your own. These were based on what many of you have already been using, compiled into something that you can access off the web. Next. Okay, so there's uh, literally uh, four sections. The first section is really an overview. I just give a brief introduction, which as you already see, I'm, I'm tough in being brief. It also has a wonderful chapter that was put together uh, in Australia for the reef restoration meeting there. Adam Smith, Boz Hancock, Nathan Cook, and also myself put in a history that was presented there that is nice to know. And also my friend Buki Rikovic, who shows the really quandary for active versus passive restoration. And as he shows, we're beyond the point of just waiting to see what Mother Nature can bring back on her own. And then finally in that chapter, a nice uh, classical study that shows the history of really uh, Ken Niedemeyer in his move from live rock farmer to live coral farmer. And I'm gonna turn it over to, to Ken uh, to make that presentation. Thanks, Dave. And now we'll pass it off to Ken. Well, thanks a lot, Dave. Uh, the chapter of the book gives a fairly detailed history of how I went from being a live rock farmer to a coral farmer. And even though I only have a few minutes to share some of the stuff, there's a lot more information in there and you should look at it when you get a chance. Uh, I want to start with, uh, next slide, please. Uh, start with this quote from Stephen Covey. Uh, it says, begin with the end in mind. That's the short version, the long versions up there. This is from his book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And the idea is, you know, you start with the end in mind. And for me, my journey to start the restoration business was based on a lifetime of being in the water. I had been diving all through the Florida Keys and elsewhere, and I knew what a live coral reef looked like. So I knew what, the, what my end goal was. Next. So shots like this were common in the Florida Keys when I first started diving in 1969, 1970. Uh, this was not the Florida Keys. This was a picture taken just a few years ago. But there were pictures like this. There were scenes like this throughout the Florida Keys. Next. Pictures like this and some of the reefs. Next. Fields of staghorn coral in places where, you know, today there's nothing at all. So I saw this. This is what I grew up seeing in the, in the Keys in the early days. Next. But this is actually a picture from Phil Dustin at Cary, Cary Sport Reef. And I started diving at Cary Sport Reef in 1973, a year or two before this picture was taking, taken. And I remember uh, just an amazing place where the coral grew right to the surface and it was just as thick and as big as you can imagine. And it was just a, a, a mind blowing place. And, um, you know, I, I couldn't get back there soon enough and it was beautiful. And there was other reefs like that throughout the Florida Keys, but things happened. If you're familiar with this picture, you're familiar with the next ones too. Next slide. And this is basically a, a 30 year progression of what happened at Cary Sport Reef. Um, going from 1975 to 2004, and I 
was living down here in the Florida Keys at that time, and I saw this all happen, uh, not just at Cary's Wharf, but throughout the Florida Keys. And it was enough to just, uh, you know, shake me to my core and move me out of my comfort zone. My comfort zone was I was a tropical fish collector. So I spent a lot of time in the water and I saw a lot of different reefs and I saw a lot of different reefs die. And I said, I got to do something about this next. So my journey began at this uh, live rock farm and there's a long story behind that, but I don't want to go into it here. But, uh, you know, it was uh, in the early days, you know, so it was just a live rock farm at the beginning, but we had a, a, an exemption in our live rock that we were allowed to harvest it, settled on it. So that became the, the nucleus of our initial nursery. Uh, as I mentioned in the chapter, when I was starting out, the internet was in its infancy. There was no Google. Uh, you couldn't just Google coral restoration or anything like that and find anything. There was nothing out there. So we had to kind of be creative. We had to uh, figure out how to do it with what we had. Uh, I was using the aquarium industry as a model because they were growing these corals in aquariums all over the country. And I thought, shoot, you know, if they can do it in an aquarium, we can do it in the ocean. Next. Like everywhere else in the, in the world that people have tried to do this, we had our own set of challenges here in the Florida Keys. Uh, we had hurricanes to deal with lobster trapping, uh, all kinds of different things. Our, in our case, you know, pretty much the only place we could do a nursery was out in the middle of the sandy fields in deeper water. So we had to figure out ways to get the corals out of the sand um, and just figure out ways to get things done. Next. It's just a, a wide view of a concrete block farm <laughs> made with used concrete blocks. Next. Uh, next. The other way. Okay, so we eventually figured out that growing corals suspended midwater was the best way to do it in the Florida Keys. It provided the best results. And uh, we started growing staghorn coral there. Next. And uh, the other way. <laughs> uh, eventually we started growing elkhorn coral. I mean, who knew you could grow elkhorn coral on a fishing line? We figured that out, but we didn't know it in the beginning. And since that time, we figured out how to grow just about every other species of coral found in the Keys. Last slide, please. Next. Okay. So, uh, you know, this is just a, an example of figuring out how to grow corals in the conditions you have. I think this has been done pretty much everywhere. There's a lot of other heroes out there in my mind, people I've gotten to know over the last 10 years that are doing this in different places with different techniques. You know, this is not. What I've done is not anything special, I don't think. Uh, a lot of other people have done similar things and been very successful at it. So my hat is off to all the pioneers that have gotten us to this point and the pioneers that are gonna take us to the next level. Thank you. Thanks, Ken, and now we'll pass it back to Dave. Thank you, Ken. And that brings us to uh, section two which is basically, a, I, I think, one of the major interests of the book. It has all of the biological considerations and methodologies from everything from land nurseries, field nurseries, asexual reproduction, fragmentation, microfragmentation, coral fusion, sexual reproduction, and two nice chapters by Hannah Koch of human-assisted evolution as well as genetics. So I'm going to, because of being, um, uh, on at least four of these chapters, try to give as quick a overview as possible. But this will not do justice for what you can uh, do uh, in in going through the book. Next. Okay, and my background was marine aquaculture of clams and oysters and shrimp. And in all of those instances, you had three different types of systems that were always included, a hatchery, a nursery, and a grow out. However, uh, the nursery could be either be a land nursery or a field nursery or both. However, in the infancies of the biology of aquaculture for corals, it was heavily utilized as the review of what uh, uh, Ken kind of gave a review for, from starting with cinder blocks with 
with fragmentating underwater a field nursery right to a grow out planting. And a lot of that is because staghorn coral really was the easiest to do. And it was thought that the hatchery technology and also utilization of massive corals was too hard and that a land nursery or a hatchery was way too expensive. Next. Okay, we find out now that more and more people are growing more than just the staghorn as Ken said, in both uh, field nurseries as well as in land nurseries, and that the hatchery technology now has progressed at least enough to give us new genotypes. And in the future, that's an area of great expansion. And what happened uh, about 15 years ago when I was working at Moat Marine Lab is some of the scientists there decided to collect uh, some of the Elkhorn mass of coral gametes, bring them into the laboratory, and we were lucky enough to get what we called the first dozen test tube baby Elkhorn corals, except that if you see the picture in the upper left, that's a picture of that newly recruited larvae settled at three months old. The picture is still through a microscope. And there's the picture at three to six months old underneath it, one single primary polyp, the size of a head of a pin. That got too slow and I decided to move it to the bottom of the aquarium and forget about it for a few years. I went to go move it and by accident broke it into tiny pieces and hence started the potential of what is now called microfragmentation. The ability to cut these into small pieces accelerates the growth and makes them available for both direct planting or for supplying to a field nursery or directly to a final location. Next. Well, this is what an Elkhorn coral first looked like at one to three years old, the size of a coin. And so I thought this was way too slow. But when cut into small pieces, it actually is triggered by accident or on purpose uh, to grow very fast, just like your skin does not grow fast unless it's cut and then it heals over. Next. This is a picture that Dan Mealy took when we were uh, doing a a documentary on showing and proving that four pieces of Elkhorn in the upper left, a picture every week for 11 weeks, shows you that it quickly after being cut starts to grow lateral extension. So the middle line is starting to grow very quickly and touch each other. But because they came from the same original piece and the genetic clone, they actually will fuse back together. And this sequence was just 11 weeks. Next. So we can do that on a regular basis now, not just take a coral of one of the, what I call the massive corals that were at the time orphan species and cut it into two and wait three years and cut it into two again, but we can take a piece and cut it into 20 to 100 tiny pieces the size of a polyp in a land-based nursery. And now there's some also instances in the book shows it being done on a boat or underwater. Next. So in the beginning, when we were, could cut a thousand in a day, we had to jam them into a tank and it took us six months to order a new tank. In the meantime, they were growing together, as you see on the right. And they're growing together because the ones that were fusing were from the same clone. And they can grow together and we use this technology now uh, called coral fusion. Just a quick sequence, ones that were planted in 2014, the size of a large pizza growing together in just two years. And recently with uh, documented by Dr. Hannah Koch that 85% of these uh, planted here in the Keys actually spawned at just a few years old. Next. And so now we know we can use all three sections, a hatchery, a nursery, and a grow out. And in other aquaculture, whether it's clams, oysters, or fish, you may only need one hatchery that can supply 10 land nurseries and 10 land nurseries supply 100 field nurseries and then each of them plant out 10,000 and that's how you get to scale of a million. Next. And one last uh, picture I wanted to show of the great chapters on genetics and assisted evolution that Hannah Koch uh, wrote and this shows all those sequences being put into place using resilient base coral restoration and actually being able to cut 
fuse and collect the gametes and start a next generation in the life cycle of a graduate student. Next. And now we move on to section three. And this is also an exciting one because it's case studies from around the world, from uh, Belize, the Seychelles, uh, Israel, um, Mexico, Australia, uh, Costa Rica, Indonesia, uh, line items, Kiribati. Also a nice one about hurricane impacts. Also one about Bonaire and also Punta Cana. We're gonna hear from two of these uh, case studies and starting uh, with the Indian Ocean with uh, Dr. Sarah Torres and also right following her, the Punta Cana story by Jake Keel. Thanks, Dave. And now we're going to pass it off to Sarah. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, I want to acknowledge the book authors Claude Rabaret, Fanor Montoya Maya, and Neil Malsha. Next. N Okay, uh, nothing in restoration ecology makes sense except in the light of global climate change. If we do nothing about the climate crisis, there's no future for coral reefs. So uh, in order to have coral reefs, we need to take climate action. We also need to work on conservation and restoration all at once. Uh, today I'll talk about restoration. Um, our chapter explains in detail coral reef restoration we implemented in the Seychelles. Next. The Republic of Seychelles is located in the Western Indian Ocean. Um, it's a small island developing state uh, comprised of about 115 islands. In the yellow square you see here are the granitic islands. There's just a few of those islands there. And that's where the, uh, the entire human population is concentrated. And then around them, there's a network of atoll type islands. Next. The granitic islands have uh, granite structures above the ocean, and then these are replicated underwater in addition to having uh, coralline growth. So there's no limitation of hard substrate for corals to attach to. Next. In um, 1998, there was um, a global El Nino combined with the Indian Ocean Dipole, which is the El Nino for the Indian Ocean. And that was a major coral killer because uh, it triggered coral bleaching that resulted in healing 97% uh, of the corals in the granitic islands. Uh, the good news is that 3% of the corals uh, survived. And then in 2004, there was the Indian Ocean tsunami. So whatever um, dead coral structures were left, they were wiped away by the nine um, tsunami waves. So the granitic islands of the Seychelles in many locations, they went from a situation of high uh, complexity, high diversity and structure in coral reefs to just an empty barren. And um, there was very limited natural recovery out of that. Next. So the United States Agency for International Development provided funding to the NGO Nature Seychelles for the reef rescues project. And this was to implement large scale coral reef restoration in the face of climate change. So this project used the coral gardening method where you collect fragments from donor corals, then deploy um, ocean nurseries, and then you transplant those corals into the degraded reef. We implemented this uh, large scale project in Kuzan Island, which is a smaller island in the center left of this image, uh, which is also a land and sea reserve. So there's no instructions and no interference from human activities. Next. So in this island, there was a, a small section of the coral reef that was not affected by the 98 El Nino, and this became our reference healthy site. We use this, the, the information in this site to determine what was our goal uh, in terms of restoration? So that means a species composition and abundance and distribution. Next. 
there was then a stretch of uh, about 50 meters uh, close to that site that uh, we left it untouched and that became our control degraded site. Next. And then a stretch of 150 meters uh, nearby the degraded site that was equally degraded was targeted for restoration. This is the, a picture we took uh, at the end of the project where every coral you see here is a coral we grew in a nursery. And then that um, uh, restoration activity caused quite an explosion of life. Next. So the project in numbers, um, it, it, those are quite impressive numbers, more than 24,000 coral colonies uh, transplanted, all grown in nurseries, um, half a hectare of reef um, restore. At the time we implemented this project, this was the largest coral reef restoration um, activity completed in the Western Indian Ocean. Next. So the USAID mandate was bigger, better, cheaper. We had to demonstrate that large scale coral reef restoration was feasible within the limited resources available in a developing country. And um, our own resource was to go MacGyver on everything. That means we had to recycle and upcycle materials. And we also use biomimicry that is taking inspiration from nature to solve the problems of scaling up a project of this type. Next. When we built the nurseries, we were using the uh, midwater floating nursery model in the ocean. That means first you need to anchor the nursery. So we were uh, using anchor bars at 18 meters depth in the sandy bottom that's in, in the nursery site. Mm -hmm. And then we use recycled jerry cans as buoys. Uh, the nurseries were kept eight meters below the surface. That's an ideal depth uh, to maximize uh, coral growth. Next. So uh, for scale, those black lines, those are the anchor bars that gives you an idea how big these rope nurseries were. We used a, a model that was developed by Bucky Rinkiewicz and team, and we scale it up and modified, uh, taking into account the, the uh, stress from scaling up this model. Uh, rope nurseries held about 5,000 corals each, and we had um, eight rope nurseries total. Next. So we collected fragments from donor colonies in the donor sites. Those were survivors of previous uh, bleaching events. Uh, at any one time, we only collected 10% of the colonies, so uh, we didn't kill the no donor colonies, and we targeted the species we found in the reference site. Next. Uh, we work with quite a diversity of species. 90% um, of the 24,000 plus corals we transplanted went to the Kusan Island site and they were all branching on tabular species. And then the rest of the corals, including the massive, submassive and encrusting, went to a secondary site that was uh, a small shallow bay um, within the premises of a five-star hotel resort. Next. So when we had the fragments, uh, the coral fragments were about thumb size and very quickly we could uh, attach them to the nursery ropes. The process was to untwist the rope, stick the fragment, twist the rope. And then next, the living layer of, of tissue on top of the coral, the sinosar grew over the rope. Uh, so the corals attached themselves to the ropes. And this was a major savings in time, uh, effort, and money in a project of this scale. Next. We also built net nurseries. Uh, we took advantage of a fat fishing aggregation device that crashed into Kuzan Island, and we repurposed the material to build these net nurseries that were 12 by 12 meters uh, square. Um, and so we use those mostly for the encrusting and massive corals. Next. Obviously, we had to clean the nurseries, make sure that uh, the corals were not grown over by a fouling. We use high-tech tools like toothbrushes. And then we also enlisted the help of uh, our friendly fish. Next. And then after six months to a year of growing in the nurseries, we then transplanted the corals into the degraded reef. Uh, we, we developed um, 
a unique mix of cement that was developed by Claude Reveret, and the delivery uh, method was a chef pastry bag. So you do this about 25,000 times and you have a brand new coral reef. Next. Um, we discovered that uh, the net nurseries and to an extent the rock nurseries became floating ecosystems that recruited uh, endangered species. Next. And also very useful species that will clean the biofouling for us. Next. So deploying our GoPro cameras, we discovered that um, the nurseries with the highest abundance of unique, uh, the unique uh, fish community that recruited were the nurseries we have to clean the least. Um, therefore, those became self-cleaning nurseries. If you build on them correctly, the fish community will clean the nurseries for you. That's a, a, a great, that's a great discovery. Next. Then uh, when we passed the 10,000 corals transplanted, we found a new problem. Um, the fish community in the, in the uh, transplanted site increased to such an extent that they began to interfere with our activities. So basically, as we just cemented a, a new coral, there will be mobs of the range fish just running against those corals that were going after um, a lot of the mobile invertebrates and whatnot that recruits into those corals while they are in the nursery phase. So we had to devise uh, some solution because otherwise we will never be able to complete the project next. So we took inspiration from the cleaning stations you find in coral reefs where small shrimp and fish will clean up uh, bigger fish out of the parasites. Uh, we conducted all the experiments and we discover next that we could set up a cleaning station uh, if we just deploy mm -hmm. uh, the rope full of corals into the uh, transplanted site and left it there about uh, 30 centimeters above the seafloor, left it there for, uh, for about 24 hours, then the uh, fish community will clean up those corals out of mobile invertebrates. And after that time, when we went out to transplant every coral and cement every coral mm -hmm. to the reef, uh, the fish will no longer go after anything. They already knew those corals were clean. Next. We deployed our GoPro cameras to determine who was cleaning what, and we discovered there was an entire uh, uh, ensemble of uh, fish species. Uh, and even more importantly, uh, the fish you see in the red squares, next are fish that were only detected by the GoPro cameras and were not detected by our underwater visual surveys. So this is also an important lesson because uh, whether you do conservation or restoration, the fish community you have there in your reef um, is not always detected when you do diver surveys and you need to use several methods to know exactly what you have down there. Next. And then we conducted uh, and recruitment, coral recruitment experiments, and we discovered that the transplanted sites perform much better in terms of coral settlement and coral recruitment than the degraded site. Um, there were new coral recruits of the species we had restored, but also the species we have not restored. And we think this is because we were um, using quite a huge number of corals to restore this site, 24,000 plus. Um, also, the size of uh, a transplant, those a transplant colonies were about 20 centimeters in diameter, so that's the size of, of a football, the density of transplanting. So we were using about four corals per square meter, and also the species composition. So our transplanted site become very attractive for new corals. The rest of the chapter explains also other restoration projects. We targeted giant clams. We also did mm -hmm. uh, quite a lot of capacity building mm -hmm. and training. And we also explain the next challenges and, and lessons learned and um, next steps we need to take in, in this kind of coral reef restoration. Next. So we conducted all the work from this teeny tiny boat. And, and this means that big projects can come from small boats. Uh, this was possible because we had an extraordinary team of scientific divers. They were rotating every three months. And like the monarch butterfly, they completed the journey of coral reef restoration in several generations. This work was funded by the United States Agency for International Development, United Nations Development Program, and the Global Environmental Facility. 
you can email or tweet me if you have any questions and thank you for your time. Thanks, Sarah. And now we'll pass it over to Jake. Okay. Hello, uh, morning, afternoon, and evening to everyone. Uh, can you hear me okay? Um, I'm going to present uh, the case study for Punta Cana Resort and Club in the Dominican Republic and our uh, history with coral restoration uh, in the Dominican Republic. Uh, and just some background, I am the Vice President of the Sustainability for Grupo Punta Cana. We are a resort development company uh, in the Eastern Dominican Republic. We've been around as a company for 52 years and I have been in uh, Dominican Republic for 16 years. Um, and working for the company, looking for solutions to many types of sustainability challenges. And degraded coral reefs are one of our larger challenges. Um, we are a company that is very dependent on our coastal resources for activities for our tourists and visitors, uh, for the services they provide uh, for our beaches, protecting the beaches, providing sand for the beaches, protecting human infrastructure, from impacts from storms. Uh, and so we are very conscientious of how important uh, coral reefs in particular are to our resort and to our development. So if you could go to the next slide, please. We began uh, a small pilot scale coral restoration project uh, in 2005 when I arrived. Uh, and the technology was brought to the Dominican Republic by a guy named Austin Bowden Kirby. Uh, who was at that time working with Counterpart International. He had developed uh, some of the uh, early um, forms of doing uh, restoration, particularly with the Acropora uh, corals. And of course, there's been many developments by many other uh, great practitioners, including some that I'm fortunate to be on the panel with, uh, including Ken and, and, and Dave and others. Um, so Austin comes and convinces us that it's a good idea to try and do active restoration. And as a resort, we had been monitoring our coral reef. We had seen decline over the years from many different impacts, from storm events, from uh, die-offs of critical species, from overfishing impacts, uh, from sedimentation. And we decided that we uh, were very attracted to the idea of actively doing something about the constant degradation of our reef. Uh, at that time, uh, there was still some skepticism about restoration as a science, uh, as a technique. Um, many of the uh, most popular uh, coral scientists at the time were really much more in favor of a hands-off approach of reducing some of the impacts on coral reefs uh, and monitoring them. And that was not as attractive to us in the private sector because we saw that uh, the degradation was happening. We wanted to be proactive and we thought that we could add something to the, to the conversation and create a small pilot in the Dominican Republic, which is a country that is incredibly dependent on, on tourism uh, and uh, therefore also dependent on its coral reefs. So we started with a small pilot nursery uh, and later on, um, as University of Miami and Rosenstiel School and researchers like Diego Lehrman got involved, uh, they looked at different um, nurseries around the Caribbean and Central America to see who was practicing uh, coral restoration, uh, what was the types of techniques they were using, what were the materials, what types of frames and types of nurseries were they uh, using. Uh, and came back to us and said at the time that we had one of the larger uh, and more successful nurseries uh, in the region. Uh, we had a huge amount of tissue of at least a Acropora cervicornis and somewhat of Palmata growing in our nurseries. Uh, and we were encouraged to continue doing the work that we were doing. But we decided we needed to be much more scientific about it. We needed to scale up our efforts uh, and we needed to really begin looking at uh, some of the techniques of outplanting as opposed to just keeping uh, corals alive in gene banks in nurseries, we really wanted to try and take the material and with as much genetic diversity as possible, transplant it back onto the reef. So we go to the next slide. 
So these are some of the early efforts uh, to try and transplant uh, corals back onto the reef. This is uh, me uh, back in the day when I used to spend a lot more time in the water and less time uh, administering projects. Um, but we discovered that there was a lot of interest, not just in our company and in our region, but throughout the Dominican Republic in coral restoration, um, that there were many folks that were concerned about degradation of reefs that wanted to contribute in some way. and often they came from the tourism sector. And so we began sharing our experience of what we were doing in coral restoration in Punta Cana uh, by growing nurseries, uh, by transplanting corals, by bringing tourists out to do some of the work and developing uh, specialized dive certification, um, by having students and researchers come and do work with us. And at the time, this was really quite unique for the tourism industry, especially in the Dominican Republic. There was no one doing anything like this uh, in the country, uh, particularly in the private sector. You can go to the next slide, please. Uh, as we continue to expand our efforts, uh, we found that there was also, uh, in the enthusiasm of groups joining into coral restoration uh, and, and wanting to help, uh, there was also a, quite a bit of informality in how people were doing it. Um, and while many of the academic institutions and the practitioners and uh, organizations and nonprofits were publishing uh, best practices and manuals and guides for growing corals, transplanting corals, monitoring corals, uh, measuring survival rates, there was quite a bit of um, informal activity where folks were taking corals, uh, growing them, and either leaving them in nurseries and using the nurseries as a fundraising or a promotional tool, or uh, simply not following up on the, trans the little transplanting they were doing. And so as we began to train new entities in the Dominican Republic in coral restoration, we thought it was important um, to try and bring up the standards of restoration. And so uh, with advice and help from a number of partners, we formed the Caribbean, uh, the Dominican Consortium of Restoration, uh, Coastal Restoration. So I'm translating it in my head from Spanish. Um, but essentially, the idea was that every new nursery, every uh, new coral restoration pro project that took place in the Dominican Republic would have a scientific background, would follow best practices, and would have a monitoring protocol. Um, at the time, the Dominican government and the Ministry of Environment was not doing this work, so we uh, filled this in. Uh, from the private sector and with partners from uh, nonprofit organizations. And this quickly grew and expanded, and now we have trained uh, numerous uh, practitioners around the Dominican Republic. Um, there are over 20 nurseries around the island that are under monitoring protocols from the consortium. We have a rotating presidency, uh, and we've managed to get resources from different international donors to keep an eye on many of the nurseries around the Dominican Republic and share best practices. Uh, incorporate new methodologies, bring in uh, researchers and other organizations to help us improve our techniques to make our work more efficient, to make the survival rates higher, to incorporate new species of corals, and really diversify uh, the, the efforts and make it much more attractive and easy for donors to look at the Dominican Republic as a site where this kind of work can be done with great credibility uh, and with uh, following best practices that have been established. Go to the next slide, please. Uh, we also found that much of the work that we're doing in restoration, this is actually a photo of Austin in one of our early nurseries uh, in one of his visits. Um, we found that it was really important to try and incorporate the local community, and that community is composed, in our case, of uh, resorts, of uh, tourist guests, but also of local fishermen. One of the major challenges we face in the Dominican Republic is severe overfishing taking place on the reef. Uh, and much of that has uh, been occurring in, in recent years, uh, spearfishing of species that weren't traditionally part of the local capture for uh, fishing. Uh, as the uh, more commercially viable species have disappeared, the groupers and the snappers and some of the more attractive species, fishermen have gradually begun what they call fishing down the food web. And so you have much more uh, fishing of species like parrotfish. We go to the next slide. Uh, and parrotfish, it's been uh, uncovered uh, in different studies, have an incredibly important role to coral reefs, to maintaining the health of reefs, uh, to maintaining the health of uh, beaches and other coastal habitats. And so as we have uh, 
degraded corals. Uh, we have increased nutrients as development is happening in our region, uh, as we have um, less species on the reef that are doing some of these cleaning services of coral reefs and removing macroalgae. Then we have uh, kind of a cycle of decline. Uh, and the fishermen we found uh, could be engaged in such a way that they would be contributors to coral restoration and not just uh, a, a problem that was causing some of the challenges that we're facing in our region. So we go to the next slide. So we approached uh, a local fisherman. Uh, we go to the next slide, uh, please, sorry. Uh, so here are the, the parrotfish I was speaking of. Uh, this slide, thank you. So these are the uh, local fishermen. As you can see, much of the capture in our region was parrotfish. This is almost 60% uh, according to some of the surveys we had done uh, were of the fish catch documented on shore were of parrotfish. So this is incredibly damaging to the reef, uh, to the health of the reef, uh, and also damaging to tourism business. Uh, tourists, it's been well documented, prefer to see uh, healthy reefs with lots of fish in them. Most tourists are not uh, very sophisticated in understanding of what corals are and uh, the diversity of corals. They like to see beautiful colors and they like to see lots of fish. Um, parrotfish provide that function and they're a very important part of recreational scuba diving and snorkeling. So obviously impacting parrotfish populations is uh, quite problematic. So we go to the next slide. So we engaged the local fishermen uh, in the early days and we trained a small group of fishermen as uh, paddy scuba divers um, and then trained them to do coral restoration work. Uh, we go to the next slide. And what we found was uh, many of the local fishermen that we engaged were very valuable to our restoration efforts because they were uh, had their own boats, they had access to, um, to the boats. Uh, they were very familiar with the reef. They knew where things were, could be find, found, what kind of coral species would grow where. Uh, and also they were very adept at working in the water. They were willing to work hard and long hours uh, in difficult conditions. They were accustomed to being on boats uh, and they were quite efficient underneath uh, the water when they were scuba diving. So we go to the next slide. So as we continue to work with local fishermen, and this is the first group of fishermen we engaged and trained and hired to work on our coral restoration efforts. We found that there were many ways we could be engaging local fishermen to reduce fishing pressures and also contribute to uh, conservation and tourism activities. And so since uh, the initial pilot, when we uh, trained and hired three local fishermen, we have now uh, trained fishermen to be boat captains, to work in the dive industry as certified divers, uh, we have groups of fishermen that work with us maintaining uh, uh, barriers to protect our beaches from sargassum seaweed, which is a, another major challenge we face. We still have fishermen that work with us on uh, specific projects and with coral restoration. We've engaged fisher families to do all kinds of activities uh, on land, um, helping grow uh, fish species on our in our Center for Marine Innovation, um, engaging them to make artisanal projects, uh, products, and so the Fisher families have become an, a key component of all of our activities, finding alternatives, finding ways to incorporate them into conservation activities, into tourism activities, uh, and at the same time, reducing fishing pressures. So this has been a strategy that we've deployed in Punta Cana at our resort, in Google Punta Cana, but it's also shared more widely and has now been uh, replicated in a number of sites in the Dominican Republic through the Consortium of Coastal Restoration, uh, and through other partners, including in areas like Paya Ibe and on the North Coast and even closer to Santo Domingo in La Caleta. Go to the next slide. As we've continued to evolve our coral restoration efforts, um, we realized when we started that um, the main species we were working with was a cropper cipicornis, which at the time was one of the few endangered species corals. Nowadays, uh, there are many corals that are uh, threatened or endangered and we needed to diversify not only the genetic material we are collecting from uh, Cervicornis, but also try and diversify other species of corals that we were working with. And we came across some of the techniques that Dave Vaughn has pioneered, microfragmentation, uh, and we decided that some of our efforts could be expanded to land-based nurseries uh, and efforts to grow corals in land-based nurseries uh, and use microfragmentation to then expand all of our efforts. We go to the next slide. 
So our Center for Marine Innovation, we created about three years ago, uh, and that center was set up to uh, expand our, our, our restoration efforts, uh, incorporate new techniques, continue to work with the local community, uh, and continue to advance coral restoration in the Dominican Republic. You can go to the last slide, please. Thanks, Caitlin. So this is our nursery, which is currently uh, in, uh, in restoration, in, in renovation. We're expanding it considerably through a project that we have uh, with the Caribbean Biodiversity Fund, an ecosystem-based adaptation project. Um, and this is uh, part of our efforts to continually look for new ways to uh, contribute to the protection of not only our coral reefs, but coral reefs in general in the Dominican Republic using the private sector as an ally and as a uh, important actor in the efforts to uh, restore coral reefs. We'll go to the last slide. Um, so I'm just honored to have been able to present a little of our work uh, in uh, coral restoration. Uh, there are some pioneers on this panel that have done amazing work and, and we are really pleased to contribute to this book, uh, a chapter on the work we've done in Punta Cana and, uh, and pleased to help uh, continue expanding these efforts and collaborate with folks that are on this webinar today. So thanks so much. Thanks, Jake. And finally, we're going to pass it off to Tali now. Hi, can you hear and see me? You can. I'm, okay, thanks. Oh. I haven't been able to see anyone, so I'm glad the video is working um, for everyone else. Um, hi, everyone. This is such an honor. Thank you, Dave, for um, inviting me along with my esteemed co-authors, Les Kaufman, Ilsa Kuffner, and Tom Moore, to actually wrap up this book and um, kind of try to tie it all together. The goal of our chapter, this last chapter, number 23, was to articulate how active restoration at various scales now, so doing these, this work now, is essential to global coral reef persis persistence um, through to the end of the century. So I'm actually going to start off, um, oh, next slide, sorry. Okay, thanks, Liz. Um, I'm going to start off with a few graphs that actually are not in the book, but I thought provided very good context for um, just this kind of wrap up period. So you can see on the top um, top left there, that's just a figure showing um, sea surface temperature with rising emissions, um, uh, both with a high and a low emission scenario. You've all seen these graphs a lot of times. On the panel below, um, you can see three um, lines that kind of go to the top. Those are the percent of high frequency bleaching. So basically what this is showing is that if corals don't adapt, they will all be experiencing these high frequency bleaching um, scenarios. Um, sorry, this has nothing to do with adaptation yet. This is just the, the percent high fre frequency bleaching um, um, under low and high emission scenarios. The only kind of, sorry, I'm having a little trouble seeing my screen here. One. One second, and I'll be a little more articulate. Okay, um, low emission scenario with adaptation is the only way that corals can kind of get past the high frequency bleaching that we are likely to see in the future. And then this is all sort of a reality check because even under low emission scenarios and with corals being, adapt being able to adapt to the high temperature scenarios that we're exposing them to, we will see about 40% of coral populations um, that existed in 2010. So again, this is a reality check that kind of no matter what we do um, at this point, the coral reefs of the future aren't really going to look like those pictures that Ken showed in 1975 or earlier in um, the 1900s for sure. But we do have to do all of this work now in order to get there. Um, advance the slides. It's the same slide. Yeah, thank you. So there's, um, this is another image from this paper by Joni Claypass and 21 other leading scientists called Designing a Blueprint for Coral Reef Survival. I just wanted to highlight um, next that reef restoration is really one component of the vast number of things that have to happen. 
obviously climate change is the big one, but they're all the rest of those green pie pieces are um, traditional coral reef management. Restoration is, is one component in red, and the purple elements are um, ensuring climate-ready coral populations, so doing things like assisted evolution. Um, so all of these components are necessary. Here we're talking about active restoration, and it's very important, but there's, there's many other things that kind of go into the picture. Next. OK. So this is really the entire chapter in one image. Um, this graph really illustrates four things at the same time. Certain types of restoration projects are appropriate at certain scales. So you wouldn't assume that you are um, restoring complex coral reef ecosystem processes if your restoration is only tens of square meters big. Um, the other thing that this graph shows is that all types of projects have value, right? So even a very small restoration project, you are providing um, perhaps tourism, jobs, money to a local area, or sustaining a local culture if that culture is very attached to that local ecosystem. Um, you might be providing even nominal biodiversity benefits in a coral population restoration that's hundreds of hundreds of square meters, so not very big, say 10 meters by 10 meters. Next. And you can see that um, in the images. Oh, did they not show up? Oh, sorry, that's the next one. Um, so yes, on the left, thanks Liz. Um, on the left of this graph, this is really where we are now. These are the restoration um, projects that happen now are really still in the kind of single species, branching morphology, um, asexual propagation stage of restoration. That's really the vast majority of restoration that's happening across the world. And it looks kind of like this image that I've showed here um, from Puerto Rico, um, uh, a planting that occurred and then about five years later of a crop or cervicornis. So this is wonderful. These, this does have um, biodiversity benefits and this is really what's happening now. Next. And where we are heading is really in the middle of this graph. So doing things like um, trying to sustain a coral population from extinction. So building a coral metapopulation meta across thousands of square meters, um, improving fishery habitat, um, building reefs so that they actually protect the coastlines um, behind them and the people that live behind them. These are larger scale restorations that are more complicated, more expensive, um, but accrue many of these benefits simultaneously. So that's kind of the restoration size and scale that we're heading towards. And note that this graph is its conceptual diagram. Um, and I'd like to credit the artist, George Bergie, a good friend of mine, who I think is actually on this call, which is really nice. Um, and uh, it's on a log scale. So it's not just getting um, bigger gradually, but we have to, each step in this graph is, um, is an order of magnitude bigger. And so I just, oh, next slide. Um, a table that we included in this chapter is kind of the minimum components needed in order to do a restoration of this size. So I'm not going to go through this in detail, but for a coral meta population, you really only need one species, right? You're trying to save, say, a specific coral from extinction, but you might need many genotypes. For a reef accretion project, um, you would need to really start moving towards that um, restoring ecosystem processes um, type goal, and you might need to augment with um, actual concrete structure um, in the water. So we wanted to lay out, this is by no means a um, planning guide for restoration, but really what's the minimum thing that you would need in order to do this um, and, and start accruing these benefits. And I incorporated this circle graph to the bottom left because this is really also where those purple pie pieces come in. If we don't plan these larger projects to be climate proof, so um, with corals that can withstand these higher temperatures, um, they're not really going to last to the end of the century. So that's really important to include in here. Finally, um, 
oh, sorry, next slide. Um, the goal ultimately is to restore those ecosystem processes. And you'll see that even though this is a log scale, there's actually a break in the log scale right before this second to last column because restoring ecosystem processes really can't happen unless you're talking about a very large scale restoration on the order of hundreds of thousands of hectares, something akin to the Great Barrier Reef. And these projects are being planned on the Great Barrier Reef in Saudi Arabia, in the Florida, Keys, the Mission Iconic Reefs project. These are large scale restorations that really seek to restore um, some of these complicated ecosystem functions on a coral reef, like population connectivity, reproduction, trophic dynamics, and all of the magic that happens when you have um, an intact ecosystem with processes that we actually don't have names for yet. Um, so conducting and planning for these projects hopefully in various other regions throughout the world will really get us to global reef persistence um, in all the places that we have reefs today. And Dave wanted me to end um, the last slide by reading the epilogue that um, I wrote for the last, um, last part of the book. So, dear reader, as an emerging restoration practitioner, you are a noble hero, a spring of hope, on a dark and dusty earth. Before you, we lay several options. The bigger your restoration, the better. The more species you cultivate and plant, the better. The more diverse your reef is, the better. If the fisheries come back, excellent. If you can support your local economy and educate your citizenry, amazing. If the corals you replanted begin mass spawning, success. If the fish that live on the reefs begin spawning, even better. If the reefs you planted are more resistant to bleaching than native reefs, a win. If you have restored a fully functioning reef ecosystem that spans several hundred kilometers, surely you deserve a prize. However, even the simple but noble practice of keeping fragmented coral species alive and cared for is a critical step on this journey. Starting a modest restoration involves getting the right training and guidance, plus careful planning and experimentation. If you made it to the final chapter of this book, you are doing your part. I commend you. Good luck. Love, Tali. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Tali. <laughs> that was a great way to end that. Uh, <laughs> and now we're going to move into, so if you would like more information, um, there's a couple links here. Um, as we said, this webinar is being recorded. Um, it'll be available on both the Reef Resilience Network and CRC websites. And we're going to go into a question and answer session. Um, so I'd like to have all the speakers uh, come back on video. And um, as we said earlier, we've been getting some questions in the question box. So you guys obviously understand how that works. You're also welcome to raise your hand and I can call on you. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and get started with some of the questions that we've had come in um, in the chat. So um, we had a question about volunteer opportunities for divers that are interested in working in restoration. Does anyone have um, recommendations for how they could get involved in this work? Yeah, I can direct them to the Nature Seychelles website. They're always looking for the volunteers. Um, so that's na nature. I can write it down in the chat. Will that work? So that, that's a way to really get hands on experience. Let me just, I'm just typing it right now. And I'd like to add that there are a number of other ways people can volunteer. Uh, we get a lot of people offering as divers that want to do the last minute of the planting of the coral but i want to say that there's a lot more than the last minute of planting a coral there's the six months of growing a coral that are in need of volunteers and so whether that is a field nursery or a land nursery uh, people could use not just divers but people that don't even know how to uh, let's say scuba dive can assist on a boat or they can assist on a land-based facility so I, I'm glad that the dive industry is is stepping up to the plate to want to be involved because it's it's a uh, um, you know uh, basically tourism that is dependent on on diving. 
having a good reef, so they should be involved. So should the uh, commercial diver equipment manufacturers get involved, but also the general public as citizen scientists, students and volunteers can also get involved. Uh, check in with your local restoration project, where, wherever that is, and see if you can sign up either as a student volunteer, a diver, or any type of uh, um, service work. I will also add, if you want to volunteer as a diver, uh, the most important thing you can do is really improve your buoyancy skills. <laughs> that is the basic. I know there's a lot of well-intentioned recreational divers and students and whatnot that they really wanted to work with us. But if you are a yo-yo diver or you're constantly scourging the bottom, I'm sorry, but this is not good for the corals. So if you really want to volunteer when it comes to scuba diving and doing restoration, uh, just really improve to the max your buoyancy skills. And that will go a long way into what you can do to help corals. Okay, thanks. Um, we have a couple of sort of practical questions coming in for Sarah. Um, people asking about the recipe for a cement mix and then how you actually outplant using cement and if there might be references that you could point people to that would give them more information about sort of the, the nitty gritty of how you conduct this kind of restoration. Yeah. So the recipe, the unique mix that was developed by Claude Reveret, uh, we decided to give it free to the world. Uh, it's published in our toolkit, which is also referenced in the book chapter. So that's the easiest way to do it. Um, when I finish talking, I'll send a link to the toolkit. But, but again, I think it's better also that you get into the book. Um, basically, very quickly, it uses marine Portland cement and then um, a, a, a component, which is a colloidal based component, it's called Sikacret. What's important is the proportions, you mix this with water. The main reason is that it's cheap to do, uh, you can find it in a, in a small island developing state, and also it delivers the cement in a way that it doesn't wash away once you deploy it underwater. Um, and the next question was? Um, the technique for actually outplanting corals using cement. Yeah, so basically you have this high-tech and delivery system, which is a chef pastry bag, which is full with the cement. You prepare the cement mix on the boat. And then once you go on the water, uh, we had corals, uh, we cut them from the nursery ropes. So you have a basket full of corals you need to outplant. And what's important, as you could see in the image, is that you uh, set up uh, two to three attachment sites. So you just drop a blob of little cement and stick the coral on it. Um, prior to that, you, it's important you uh, brush the area where you're going to outplant the coral because then that cleans out of any biofilling you might have. And then the mix uh, cures within one hour, the cement mix, and then the corals grow over that uh, cement attachment. So you have the corals that are both cemented and self-attached to the substrate. Thanks, Sarah. This question was for Jake, but I think probably everyone can hope answer this question. Um, how can I restore an ecosystem at low cost? It's a big one. <laughs> I, well, hopefully everybody can help me out on this one as well. Um, I don't know that there's a way to restore it at low cost. I think there are ways to be very creative about financing and looking for diverse sorts of sources of financing. One of the challenges that we run into quite often is um, that people that are well-intentioned get into restoration with the idea that it is gonna be relatively cheap to do or not require skills or capacity or staffing or boats uh, and, and realize quite quickly that, it's, that it is, you know, there are costs associated doing this work. It has to be realistic you're entering into uh, management and restoration of an endangered species in many cases and a species that is uh, highly at risk in many places uh, and so it's a long-term work uh, so you know we are uh, often very um, careful about the types of projects that we take on with partners and and even our restoration consortium we require 
that new enter new uh, resorts or practitioners that are entering into restoration have some kind of plan for funding this work because often uh, the resorts or hotels or people with really great intentions see that restoration is just a handful of metal frames or PVC pipes or rope uh, uh, in a nice spot and uh, and that seems fairly simple and inexpensive but when you have to maintain them even if you're using a toothbrush like in the case of Sarah or you're using just metal brushes uh, you need people, you need boats, you need gas for the boats, you need dive equipment, you need insurance, you need uh, to think about what's going to happen to these nurseries when there are storms, when there are years when your dive shop or your hotel isn't is doing, doing as well. So we really need to be thoughtful about uh, really planning for nurseries as a long-term endeavor. You know, this shouldn't just be thought of as a one-off thing. Uh, I often think, you know, when, when we think of restoration or a recovery or conservation of other species, you know, you wouldn't just uh, grab an endangered rhino and put it in your backyard and not think about how you were going to pay for it and how you were going to feed it and how you were going to maintain it and if it got sick. And you would really think about long term, how am I going to take care of this animal? The real we should be thinking the same way about corals. This is a long term endeavor. If you're getting into conservation and restoration, you should really take it quite seriously. Um, and that doesn't mean that there aren't ways to do it inexpensively. We should be working hard to be more efficient, uh, to be more cost effective, to be uh, as low cost as we can, uh, simplifying using locally uh, available materials. Uh, as Sarah mentioned, being very MacGyver, I think Dave is kind of an expert at doing things with uh, on low cost basis. But let's not undersell uh, what this work requires in terms of in terms of cost. So I think that's a, a key lesson. Um, I think we're getting better all the time at finding new sources of funding from the private sector, from donors, uh, involving new sectors in financing this work uh, with social impact investing. Uh, in Mexico, we've seen insurance schemes. We've seen all kinds of ways creatively to finance the work. Um, but I think it's very really important to, to 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 be very honest and transparent about what this is going to what this is going to take to really scale it up in a big way. I just wanted to amplify that sometimes it's important to step back and decide is is a restoration needed or something else is needed. So sometimes all you need to do, all you need to do, which is also work, is to stop what's killing the corals. So if you have uh, trolling and trolling nets going through your coral reef or an outflow of uh, you know, sewage killing your coral reef, no amount of restoration is going to fix that. So first you need to eliminate the local stressors, what's happening right there, um, to a certain level that then if you do restoration, the same restoration you are doing is not being killed by those stressors. So that's important to highlight that. And as Jake said, Yes, we in these talks it seems we we have presented all this work and it seems easy, right? I mean it's wonderful, uh, but we are not talking about the amount of effort and the hours. Not just, I mean, money you can always find more or less money. No, it's the effort and persistence, and and keep working when you literally you have no fingerprints anymore in your fingers from the time spent on the water when you are stung by a uh, man of war and you are burning, your face is burning and you still have to do that work. It's this kind of persistence many times that that's missing. So um, again, yeah, we're kind of a little bit wild in, in that sense. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to add uh, about scale and, um, and cost. Uh, to me, it's fairly simple that if you are going to spend a year producing a few hundred corals, your cost per coral is very high. Once you start producing a few thousand corals a year, it really comes down greatly. And if you can, with the same facilities and the same people, start producing tens of thousands of corals or better, all of a sudden your prices drop from starting at $1,000 a coral your first year to maybe $100 a coral your second year and maybe 25 the third year, and in many places like Belize and Mexico and other places, they have the cost down uh, to a few dollars a coral planted and they do it by expanding the use of also of fishermen. Stop making scientists plant corals. 
make it so that it is a labor, local divers, volunteers, and fishermen doing the work. I think Jake showed it very well that those fishermen have their boats. They know how to dive. They know where it is. They're the most efficient. And I believe I always said that you should be able to, in the future, grow a coral for a dollar and plant it for a dollar. What fisherman with his family wouldn't want to be paid a dollar a coral to plant 1,000 corals in a day? You'd have a lineup of fishermen wanting to make that amount. And at scale, I think you can get the production in the future as you get to scale down to those kinds of costs. And that way, when those numbers you saw Tally talking about tens of acres, hundreds of acres, tens of thousands of acres or hectares, is then possible. So that leads into another question, which is what dream tools, and I'll add methods into that, do you wish you had to reach the next two orders of mag magnitude of re restoration scale? What I, I, I can just, wish is here. <laughs> sorry. You wanna I, go I would say that for us, a lot of it is just, Dave sort of mentioned, you know, you have conservationists or scientists. Um, there are other fields of interest that could, I think, add a lot to this conversation, you know, whether it's uh, what types of materials or substances or structures we're using to outplant, you know, corals back onto the reef. The most efficient ways to do that, you know, experts in processes and logistics, um, thinking about the ways that, you know, we measure corals, you know, we're starting to get a lot more technology involved in measuring the outplants and how successful they are without having to measure each individual coral and using new uh, techniques to do that. I think, you know, we're, we, we've got some of the science down. We understand how corals live and grow and can be uh, reproduced, at least, you know, asexually in many cases and now starting to be sexually. But I think, you know, there are pieces of this process that we could turn this into much more of sort of a factory for coral production and have you know, a lot more uh, volume and a lot more scale to this by, by adding other uh, fields of interest to, to the area. That would be my suggestion because I feel that often, you know, we're tinkering in an artisanal scale. Uh, and if you bring in sort of other expertise, you might be able to scale this up much faster using different materials and different areas of, uh, of expertise. Yeah, I, I was just going to add um, that some of these new technologies have been invented and are kind of operating on a small scale. I like to think of um, the larval propagation pools that have been um, shown to be successful in um, Philippines, I think Thailand and Australia, and um, are now being used in the Caribbean too by Seacor and other places, maybe in the Dominican Republic as well. Um, where it's really it's not really a high-tech tool it's kind of like a baby bathtub but the idea is to like really mother hen the baby corals for a certain amount of time so that you have just a higher density of corals that can um uh, i also call it marinating the reef in baby corals so you're really getting this high density of corals in whatever location you're trying to restore so it's really not fancy technology, but there is a lot that goes into it. And it's not really at scale yet, but it is um, it is a technology that um, seems to have a lot of promise because if we can get, if we can harness the natural ability of corals to spawn so many babies and just have more of those babies actually survive by protecting them over those first few weeks, maybe a little bit more over the next months and years than than we're used to, we can rebuild coral reefs a lot faster than tinkering with one coral at a time. That I, I think that's kind of the technology of the future. I think uh, you I let, so, also out there uh, for other industries, you know, the shrimp, fish, clam, oyster industry scaled up 40 years ago by implementing specializations. Uh, not everybody had to make their own equipment. You don't have a corn farmer necessarily running a lab for, you know, genetics. Uh, they, you buy corn seed from a hatchery or you have a number of land nurseries. Everybody doesn't have to have a land nursery or a hatchery, but we need to share in the scale. Like one regional hatchery making genetic diversity could supply 10 land nurseries 
that then supply a hundred field nurseries that supply thousands of corals to be planted. This we should just learn from existing other engineering of aquaculture species and not just think coral is alone. And then second, we can learn a lot, I think, by uh, the new types of ocean exploration equipment that is a little more high tech, but being made uh, for the future. And whether that's monitoring, ways to uh, utilize, uh, ways to monitor an entire reef that's been planted, uh, not just a single coral at a time that's been planted. Those are two big things I think would advance the industry. Yeah, so I'll add, so adding to what David said, is the concepts of automation and chain production that is missing here. It is true that it seems we're very artisanal, but the next step, what David is saying, is adding this specialization, which is part of the chain production concept. Um, so yeah, techniques and technologies we can always develop more, but I think what's also missing here is that that this this specialization becomes an income uh, uh, producer. Um, a livelihood for the people involved there. So the job of actual coral reef restoration technician becomes an income generator for the local communities. And we can use the model that David was talking about, where not everyone needs to grow their own nursery. For example, there's a centralized coral nursery, just to call it that way. And then just the job of putting those corals into the reef it generates money for the people doing that. It's an actual job. So it, that, it no longer relies on having grants or having just volunteers, not to demean what volunteers and grants can do. Obviously, they're important. But if we want to do this in a, long, in a much larger scale, uh, in a sustainable manner, we need to have these income generation opportunities for the people involved in the process. Thanks. Um, we have so many great questions and we're not going to have time for them all. So I'm going to ask one more quick one and then we want to do kind of a little wrap up. Um, does anyone have any on, advice on creating relationships with local stakeholders, such as hotels or local fishermen? Yeah, I, I just want to mention one thing that has always been apparent. There's a, there's a, uh, a Japanese youth a university in Japan that actually has been studying all types of species of natural resource restoration projects. And they have a project called ILEC. It was basically called, called the acronym for involving local knowledge. And if you don't involve local environmental knowledge, there are studies I've shown for over 30 years that a restoration project, no matter it's reforestation or fisheries, it's not going to be successful. So you must engage the community. You must engage it so it's them that is being a part of it, them having ownership of it, and them being able to continue it long term. If you don't involve the community, you're destined to fail. So okay, I will add. Okay. okay. <laughs> Go ahead. Know, know your community. The fishers, they always know the ocean. They always know the fish and the coral. So that's the first point of contact be in good terms with them and then know the the uniqueness of the community you are we discovered in seychelles that if we wanted to spread a message of any kind you have to talk to the taxi drivers in the island because mm -hmm. as they were driving everybody else they will explain the story so that was our approach we first taxi drivers we talked to we said we're doing this project in the island this is what we're doing this is what's going to happen and we think about couple of days, everybody in the island knew who we were, what we were doing. And so again, know your ecosystem, but always the first point of contact has to be the fishers. They know everything about the ocean. Okay, Dave, I just wanna give you a second to let people know where they can buy the book. And then we're gonna share a coupon code in case people have to jump off right at 1.30. I don't wanna people to miss out on that. Yeah. You Thank you. You can buy it through Amazon or through the publisher, Jay Ross. And the publisher is offering uh, for uh, people on this webinar a 30% uh, discount uh, on that uh, a code that's going to be shown in the chat. And also, we will be doing the same thing as a plug for ReFutures, for those who can attend the ReFutures meeting uh, in December. Uh, we are going to sponsor 
a cocktail reception for the authors of the book. So people can come and ask the authors a question, maybe get them to sign their chapter and uh, have a one-on-one -on -one there at ReFutures and we'll also offer a 30% discount at the, that time. But I just wanna leave with one other thing that this is hope. And I hope that all of you in reading this book and in another five years can be writing your own book to show the new technology that hopefully will develop in the future from what we've laid out and started. Please use this as, as a car with wheels that works, but I expect to see race cars being developed in large scale in the future and do it well. And well, thank, huge you. thank you to all our wonderful, wonderful speakers today. And that's the end of this webinar. Just a reminder that it will be posted um, both at the Reef Resilience Network website and the CRC website. So if you know anyone who missed it that would like to listen, um, it will be available there. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.